Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the final portion related to steel structures and how we're going to analyze them and review them and a bit more explanation about them. Thank you so much for being here to view this video. I really appreciate it. You could be anywhere else and you chose to be here. So let's get started. Great. So what we're going to be chatting about for this video is the erection portion of steel structures that we left off on the previous one. Okay. Uh, now I'll remind you that uh, I'd posted the, this time lapse that shows how steel structures can be erected. Right. Remember this from the previous uh, lecture that was uh, posted for you. Okay. Uh, I also want to remind you about the previous videos that have been uploaded for you relating to steel structures and assignment one. Both of them are going to be helpful in continuing in the understanding of steel structures, including the erection and stability portion of this. Um, especially the part where I was on the whiteboard sketching out how to look at directions and framing and bracing of uh, certain elements, especially related, I think, to your project one for working drawings. I'll link them at the bottom for you anyway, so you don't have to sweat it. But if you can't find them, go look for them on Brightspace. Okay, great. So how do you erect uh, steel structures? Well, typically, I want to remind you, steel structures are not usually used for tall buildings in Canada. Not typically. Uh, they're convenient because they're erected quickly, fast, at a very good price. So they're usually within just a few stories. Two stories typically, sometimes up to five. But as you can see here, when you erect steel structures, you start with the columns, right? Now, when you put up the columns, you have to frame them, embrace them properly, fasten them properly to the bottom and to the piers and uh, the uh, footings that need to be the base of your structure. I'm showing two examples of that here. Uh, the connection of a steel column looks like a W section to a, a concrete pier. And when you do that kind of connection, you have to make sure that that connection itself starts out being level. Because as long as that connection is level flat, then the column on top of it is straight. But if it isn't, then the rest of your building follows. Kind of like the Tower of Pisa, right? Tower of Pisa actually, when it started uh, tipping over, it kind of was built at an angle so it looked like it was straightening out. Regardless, so here's an example where you see leveling nuts at the bottom of the plate. And those leveling nuts are kind of used to adjust the plate itself to make sure it is level. The second method I show here is by using leveling shims. And leveling shims are basically thin pieces of metal that you kind of slide under at a required location to kind of lift that corner of the plate so that it is level. Okay. Uh, anyways, so now that you've put up the columns, and I want to remind you about columns, right? Uh, we looked at column splices in the previous video, so I want to recommend that you go check that out. Uh, because columns need to be connected themselves. But anyways, you put up the columns, then you put up beams, like you see on the uh, left-hand side, on the image on the left-hand side right here, okay? And then once you put up the beams, or if you want to think of them as girders, then you put up the secondary structural elements, either the joists or the open web steel joists, like you see on the right-hand side, okay? And then you basically continue until you reach the top of your building. It's very repetitive in that respect, and that that's what makes it so great. Now, in order for this to be done properly, as you can see here, you have to start properly. And that is at the connection and the setup between the bottommost column and the pier and footing supporting it. Okay? If that footing is, say, too shallow, or say if that footing is not wide enough, well, that footing is going to tip over and you don't want that to happen with your building, right? So you want to make sure that that footing is wide enough. And let me sort of try to give you an understanding of why you want your footings to be wide enough to ensure stability and straightness of your structure. Okay, let's look at this. On the left hand side, can you see that sumo wrestler? 
Well, sumo wrestlers, in order to be stable, they make sure that their stance, their squat stance, is as wide as possible while still being able to move. That way, it's harder for their opponents to push them and move them and push them out of the ring. On the right hand side, instead, you see a bowling pin. Bowling pins are, by design, have a small base. That way, a gentle enough push by either a neighboring bowling pin or a bowling ball will tip them over, right? So you want to make sure that for structures, for buildings, you want that base to be as wide as reasonably possible, okay, in your footings so that your structure is stable, just like a sumo wrestler. What we're going to do now is I'm going to try to introduce you to the topic of post and beam construction. It's a very simple topic, but it is also very important. What I show here are two examples taken from your textbook of post and beam construction, right? You see a Roman or a, a Greek columns on the right, on the left hand side, and then you see Stonehenge or a Stonehenge type structure on the uh, Sorry, let me try this again. Left hand side is Greek Roman columns and beams. And on the right hand side, a Stonehenge type structure. And this is what post and beam is all about. It is literally two posts with a beam on top of it. Okay, that's all there is to it. But as you can see, simply by putting two posts and a beam on top of it, well, that's not good enough because if you have a lateral force like you see here on the left hand side, or if you have a side force that pushes eye into the screen or out of the screen, neither setup, neither frame will stay up, right? It's okay if you just push straight down, but even then, if you push straight down enough, the post will simply move out. So what do you do with post and beam construction to make sure that it stays up and the forces that are coming either down from the beam or sideways do not topple over this structure? Well, maybe you can connect the beams to the columns, right? That way now any force that's put on the beam is passed down to the columns. And this can be done with nails, screws, or bolts. We've actually seen this kind of connection because it's the so-called type two connection, shear connections that we saw in our previous lecture, right? When you connect the web of a W section to a column, a steel column. It's gonna be linked for you at the bottom as well so you can find it or go to Brightspace to find it. That's fine, but the problem is, even in that case, when you connect the column, sorry, the beam to the column with a shear connection, and then with the columns connected to simply a footing, the structure is still unstable. Because, as you see here, it topples over. It basically behaves as if it were a chain. Because that's what a chain is. It's a whole bunch of straight links that are connected with one element to the neighboring one, right? So each link is rigid, good enough. But when you connect them together, unless you pull on your chain or somehow make it taut, your chain is floppy, right? If you hold up a chain and let go, it's gonna flop over because a chain is simply linked together. And that's what this structure is, okay? When you have these shear connections only between columns and beams. So what to do? How do you make this setup stable? One way to do it is by cross bracing, like I show here, okay? That works very well. Suddenly, when you start putting forces, lateral forces, it won't topple over because the cross braces resist those lateral forces, okay? Great. Does that work every time? Well, not really, right? This works fine if the forces are going side to side, left to right on your screen. Uh, but what happens say, if you wanna put something in that frame like a door? Well, you have cross bracing in the way, you can't cut the cross bracing. So is there something else that could be done? Enter K bracing. Key bracings are kind of cross bracings that have been 
changed a little bit so that instead of going corner to corner, they go corner to middle of the beam. Okay? They're very convenient. They're a bit more complex to analyze and to assemble properly, but they work well. And what I'm trying to show here are two types of uh, K-bracing. The first one you see here is, so is a common K-bracing detail. Uh, this is where you have the oblique members, the middle line of the oblique members, their forces, connect into the beam at the same location, right? The other one that I'm trying to show here is this one, where you see those oblique members, the forces coming onto those oblique members, when they hit the middle of the beam, it's not at the same location, right? They're eccentric. So these are two different kinds, and the way they're dealt with is by properly placing those web stiffeners. Remember how we talked about web stiffeners in the previous video when I talked about the assignment number one? Again, linked for you at the bottom, but if it isn't, go look it up on Brightspace. Well, that's great. Problem solved, right? If you're going to build something within that frame, K-braces take care of it, right? Lateral bracing, and you can put stuff there. Not quite. Right? If you want to build something and it's big enough that it's going to interfere with the K-braces, well then you have a problem. What do you do about that? Right? Well, enter rigid connections or so-called moment connections. Remember these from our lecture? They're the type 1 connections. They're the ones where, if you remember, the top flange, the bottom flange, and the web of the W section are all fastened, clamped to that column, okay? And just go and find out where I talk more about this in the previous uh, lectures. So that's it. Rigid connections it is. They save the day because they open things up, right? Well, not quite. Not quite, right? Why aren't we all doing rigid connections everywhere if it's that convenient, right? It opens things up. They're an architect's dream. Well, let's look at the differences, or the benefits, I guess, of one versus the other. Braced frames, and by that I mean cross-braced, K-braced, or other similar forms, are typically less expensive than rigid connections. Okay? They're also easier to erect. Okay? Because the connections between all of these members are much simpler than rigid connections. Okay? Furthermore, for braced frames, the size of the columns, the size of the beams are much smaller compared to moment frames, to rigid frames. Because with rigid frames, you're forcing the beams to not rotate, right? That those connections, because they're clamped. So you have to make them thicker and bigger to resist that bending force. Furthermore, for braced frames, racking is much less and that is the side to side sway okay typically you got a lot less of it when it comes to braced frames compared to rigid frames and lastly when it comes to braced frames compared to rigid frames typically the footings of braced frames can be smaller compared to an equivalent rigid frame okay so you know what all of this translates to Right? Well, uh, sorry, I went through these already one by one. Uh, basically, the braced frames are much more economical to build, design, install, and they end up with a better user experience. Okay? Rigid frames, the ones where you really don't have any bracing and you all put these rigid connections between beams and columns. They're great in theory, but they're so difficult to put in practice, okay? Now, it can be done, but uh, as often as not, they're not done well. And that's not because people don't know how to install them. It's simply because they're difficult to make, um, to get them to behave as rigid connections, okay? You can design it properly, install it properly, and it's still not adequate. Or if you want to make sure that it is adequate, it costs a fortune, okay? So typically braced is the way to go if you want to make sure that your structure is stable 
and it doesn't move much side to side. Okay, great. All right, so now I wanna talk a little bit about horizontal braced frames, okay? And this is what I mean. You know how we were talking about side to side sway, right? But buildings are not two dimensional. They're three dimensionals, right? They also go in this direction. So you're not supposed to only stop this kind of racking. You also wanna stop this kind of racking, right? So you're gonna have braced frames both in the depth and width length dimensions, as well as the flat dimension, that is floors and roofs as needed, okay? So for example, you can see these, these are examples of diaphragms. And I took these photos in the ACE building. That's the ceiling of the cafeteria in the ACE building. You see those cross bracings in the ceiling? Those are diaphragms to ensure that that roof portion acts as a braced frame, okay? Great. So what do you do with tall buildings? I know I've said that with steel construction, typically in Canada, you don't go very high, right? Because uh, it kind of loses its benefits. But what you do if you do want to make a tall building in steel? Well, you have to make sure that you build a bracing that braces this tall structure well. So one way to do it is to install a core. Can you see this core that's coming through the middle of this building? Okay, this is a steel building. You can see it on the construction here where the reinforced concrete core acts as the stabilizer to the structure. And then the steel structure for the floors and the columns is kind of hung off of this core. Okay, so that's one way to do it. You can also build cores that are of braced K uh, frames, right? They go up in the same fashion. There's multiple ways to do it, okay? That's it. I wanna thank you so much for your time. That's all that I wanna cover really related to erection, uh, post and beam, and uh, bracing. Um, if you have more questions, you can ask them. Make sure you review the relevant portions in the textbooks and have a lovely day.